Well, good morning, pioneers. Welcome aboard to worship at Grace United Methodist Church. And do you realize we are joining, uh, joining together with those uh, across central Illinois who are, uh, who are getting a hold of this by television, others uh, that may be even in other parts of our country or even around the world who are watching this um, on, on our uh, website. So wherever you are, Welcome to worship. May I remind you, we're just simply joining a much bigger group than that, those that are, are on earth and in heaven who are worshiping our Lord Jesus Christ this day. There are, there are countless numbers of us who are worshiping Christ. So let's join our voices and our hearts in worship of him. We uh, want to remind you, you have a blue attendance sheet that you can fill out, and if you would, uh, get that ready for the offering. The offering is coming early in the service. I'll just give you a heads up, so if you think you've got a little bit of time, you might want to rethink that. Um, also, uh, there's just a handful of folks who haven't picked up their 2022 uh, offering envelopes. We'll leave those out just today. This is one more time for you to uh, pick up outside of the church office. Also in your bulletin, pay attention because there are, uh, there are some, there's a little list of some coming events in March and April uh, so that you can get those on your calendar ahead of time. I believe that's it. And so we'll have the choir now lead us in the intrite.
How about an amen to that? Amen. Amen indeed. Would you please stand and we'll join together in the call to worship. There is none like our God in all the earth. Nor are there any works like his. All the nations he has made shall come and bow down before him and glorify his name. For great is our God, who alone does wondrous things. Our hymn of praise is, How Great Thou Art. Most of you know this, I am sure. So let's sing it out.
Please be seated. Our invitation to the offering is couched in these terms from Psalm 116, verses 12 through 14. How can I repay the Lord for all his goodness to me? I will lift up the cup of salvation and call on the name of the Lord. I will fulfill my vows to the Lord in the presence of all his people. How can I repay the Lord for all his goodness to me? There is no way we can. That's the, that's the implication of that question. And so what we do is we respond. We respond by being thankful. We respond by fulfilling the vows that we've made to the Lord. We respond by coming into the presence of God's people and doing so with rejoicing and with gifts. So as we give today, let's give with great joy, recognizing that we can never repay the Lord for all his blessings to us. Thank you.
So Lord, hear us as your pilgrim people this morning, as those who are merely passing through this life and headed to glory. We thank you for the privilege of doing good while in this life and of serving in your kingdom and using the gifts that you've given us for your eternal purposes. So receive these gifts and receive our lives and help us in our pilgrim pathways to make a difference that not only may we experience your glory when we leave this life, but may many others be influenced by us as well and may jo join us in eternal praise and thanksgiving to you. In Christ's holy name we pray, amen. You may be seated. We'll uh, join together in the congregational prayer in just a minute. I um, wanted to let you know of another sad happening in our staff. Um, Nicole Whitaker's mother was killed in a one-car accident in Florida on Friday. Um, and so uh, Nicole is, is obviously uh, suffering under that as well as family. And so would you please uh, embrace the Whitaker family in your prayers and uh, lift them up um, over the next couple of weeks. We don't know any of the details really, um, but um, I know that they would appreciate your, appreciate your prayers. We'll invite any of you who would like to come and join us here at the rail to do so, and we'll have a few moments for personal prayer, and then we'll join together in the responsive prayer. Loving and faithful God, we bless you for calling us to be a holy people, living for you in service to each other for the sake of your world. We pray that our congregation will experience a rich and free sharing of the gifts you have generously given us. Knowing that we are called to be your holy people, we humbly ask that you work powerfully through us to accomplish your good purposes in the world. We pray for the courage, the patience, and the generosity of spirit that comes from imitating the love you have shown us in Christ. We long for your Holy Spirit's power to make us more Christ-like in our thoughts, words, and deeds. Holy Father, help us to think of others and their needs even now as we pray for creation in its groaning and waiting for all things to be made new. Lord Jesus, have mercy. So we pray for the world in its suffering, sadness, and sorrow. Lord Jesus, have mercy. So we pray for our nation and city in need of healing that only, can only come from your fountain of blessing. Lord Jesus, have mercy. So we pray for those in danger of missing your kingdom out of fear, negligence, rebellion, or doubt. Lord Jesus, have mercy. Have mercy, Lord, have mercy on all of us and whatever the condition of our souls, and draw each of us into your love that embraces us. 
We pray in the name above every name, Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. I invite you to stand as we prepare our hearts to hear the word of God and we'll sing Depth of Mercy, number 355. Would you please stand? Scripture for today is from Matthew chapter 13, verses 24 through 43. Jesus told them another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like a man who sowed good seed in his field. But while everyone was sleeping, his enemy came and sowed weeds among the wheat and went away. When the wheat sprouted and formed heads, then the weeds also appeared. The owner's servants came to him and said, Sir, didn't you sow good seed in your field? Where then did the weeds come from? An enemy did this, he replied. The servants asked him, do you want us to go and pull them up? No, he answered, because while you're pulling the we- up the weeds, you may uproot the wheat with them. Let both grow together until the harvest. At that time, I will tell the harvesters, first collect the weeds and tie them in bundles to be burned, then gather the wheat and bring it into my barn. He told them another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed, which a man took and planted in his field. Though it is the smallest of all seeds, yet when it grows, it is the largest of garden plants and becomes a tree, so that the birds come and perch in its branches. He told them still another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like a yeast that a woman took and mixed into about 60 pounds of flour until it worked all through the dough. Jesus spoke all these things to the crowd in parables. He did not say anything to them without using a parable. So was fulfilled what was spoken through the prophets. I will open my mouth in parables. I will utter things hidden since the creation of the world. Then he left the crowd and went into the house. His disciples came to him and said, Explain to us the parable of the weeds in the field. He answered, The one who sowed the good seed is the son of man. The field is the world, and the good seed stands for the people of the kingdom. The weeds are the people of the evil one, and the enemy who sows them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the age, and the harvesters are angels. As the weeds are pulled up and burned in the fire, so it will be at the end of the age. 
the Son of Man will send out his angels, and they will weed out of his kingdom everything that causes sin and all who do evil. They will throw them into the blazing furnace, where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Then the righteous will shine like the sun in the kingdom of their Father. Whoever has ears, let them hear. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. Good morning. Will you bow with me for just a moment for prayer? We need you, Holy Spirit, as we attend to things unseen, as we look into the end of the age and the coming judgment. Father, make our hearts soft before you, tender toward others, hungry for your truth, and eager to make you known in all the earth. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, we're continuing our sermon series on unseen realities today with a challenging topic about which the Bible clearly teaches, but which gets very little airtime from the pulpit these days. The title of this message is The Eternal Existence of Unbelievers, but it could be titled The Unseen Reality of Hell. Now, I decided that that might that title might keep some of you home today, (laughs) so I softened it a little bit. But please, don't turn off that television set, don't close out that YouTube screen, and don't turn off your hearing aids. (laughs) This is an important message, and it comes straight out of the Scripture and right from the loving heart of your Heavenly Father. You might ask, Why would I choose to preach on what many people would deem an archaic idea? And here's the reason. Because although we cannot see it now, hell is real. The judgment to come is true according to Jesus and according to the whole witness of the Scripture. If hell is real, and if some within the range of my voice or anyone in our own families, or our circle of friends, or our neighborhoods, may experience hell in the future, then I must not neglect to warn them and to warn all of us of this unseen and bitter reality. So let's begin by examining the text that Sig read for us today from Matthew 13. I had him read a rather lengthy passage because it does all fit together in one coherent message. Jesus told the parable of the wheat and the weeds, but the disciples didn't quite understand it, so when they got him away from the crowds, they asked him to explain it in plain language, and as our gracious Savior always does, he explained it to them. Sig read both the parable and the explanation, and then in between, Jesus gave two short parables on the kingdom of God, which was actually our topic last Sunday. But here's how all of that fits together. First, this world is part of God's kingdom, where he is continually planting kingdom seeds. The mission of Jesus to gather more and more people into his kingdom goes on and on continually until the day he returns. He scatters his followers all throughout the world as good seed that he is planting. We, brothers and sisters, are his invitation. We are the seed of the gospel. Jesus then adds to that image by telling us the kingdom seeds are the tiniest. Sometimes you may feel very small in the midst of God's kingdom or in the midst of this world. Kingdom seeds are tiny, but they grow an enormous tree. There is room in the kingdom of God for anyone who wants to come in. And Jesus says the kingdom is like yeast in a huge amount of flour. It doesn't take very much to work the kingdom into every corner of the world, but it does take time, like bread dough rising. The kingdom is accessible to all, and it keeps expanding throughout the whole world as the followers of Jesus scatter out among the unbelievers 
and keep planting kingdom seeds. Second, the devil and his followers also busy themselves planting seeds. Just like Jesus has his followers, Satan has his followers too. Those who follow him are the weeds that grow up alongside the followers of Jesus. Jesus does not give us permission to go around pulling out the weeds, however. Until the day he returns, the opportunity still exists to become a good plant in the kingdom, a follower of Jesus. Some who look like weeds right now may yet become the finest wheat. Third, and here's where your outline begins in your bulletin. The unbelievable reality is that there will be those who persist in unbelief, who never surrender to Jesus. It is unfathomable, but there will be those who persist in unbelief and never surrender to Jesus. That's called in theological terms the mystery of iniquity. Some will prefer to remain dead in sin rather than to live in Christ. What will happen to them when Jesus returns is the topic of this message. Jesus says, the angels will come and separate the wheat and the weeds. Those who have not trusted Jesus for their salvation will be bundled up together first and thrown into the fire. So let's read verses 41 and 42 again. The Son of Man will send out his angels, and they will weed out of his kingdom everything that causes sin and all who do evil. They will throw them into the fiery furnace where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. So who are the weeds that will be thrown into the fire? Besides Satan himself, and everything that causes sin, our text says the weeds are those who do evil. Now, we can probably identify in our own minds those we think have been evildoers throughout our history, like Nero or Hitler. Well, it makes sense to our sense of justice that they would be thrown into the fire, but Revelation 20 gives us some additional insight into who are weeds to be burned in the fire. The Apostle John writes that everyone who has ever lived will stand before God when Christ returns, those living on earth at the time and those who have died. Here's what John writes in verses 12 through 15 of Revelation 20. And I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne, and books were opened, Another book was opened, which is the book of life. The dead were judged according to what they had done as recorded in the books. If anyone's name was not found in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. The only way, friends, to have your name written in the book of life is by faith in Jesus Christ, the Son of God who came to take away the sins of the world and to give to those who trust in him new life and the right to become children of God in his everlasting kingdom. There will be those who die as citizens of the kingdom of this world, citizens of the evil one's kingdom. There will also be those who die committed to the way of Jesus. And those who die with no particular allegiance at all. All of us together will face God as the books are opened. The weeds are all those whose names are not found in the book of life. They were relying perhaps on their own works for salvation or did not realize they needed salvation at all. They will not enter God's kingdom but will be thrown into the lake of fire. Paul also writes of those who are weeds in 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verses 8 and 9. He writes this, He will punish those who do not know God and do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. 
They will be punished with everlasting destruction and shut out from the presence of the Lord and from the majesty of his power. The weeds are those who do not know God or obey him. Their punishment is not God's desire, brothers and sisters. He has not yet returned to this earth precisely because he is patient with those who are here now who still have an opportunity to trust in Christ. The punishment assigned for the weeds is punishment they bring upon themselves by refusing God's offer of life in Jesus Christ. As long as we have life and breath on this earth, God continually holds out before us the offer of everlasting life in Jesus. To obey the gospel is to accept this gift, yet some will refuse, and they will choose death. So we've identified then those who are the weeds, those who do evil, those who have not trusted Christ for their salvation, those who do not know him and do not obey him. The logical question to ask then is, what is this unseen hell like? The scriptures describe hell vividly. You'll find it described in the Gospels, in the New Testament letters, in the Psalms, in the prophets, and the writings of the Old Testament as well. Here are some of the ways that it's described. As fire, as a devouring, consuming fire, a valley of fire, a lake of fire, a fiery furnace, The psalmist writes about hell as a pit, as a bottomless, dark pit. Revelation calls it the second death, and the Gospels speak of outer darkness. So, on your outline, hell is a fire, it is a pit, the second death, and outer darkness. But more importantly, Hell is, as Paul wrote in 2 Thessalonians 1, 9, everlasting destruction. Everlasting destruction. The suffering and punishment of hell never ends. Just as you and I will live on in eternal peace and joy and love face-to-face with our Creator and our Savior, those whose end is in hell will live on in torment for all eternity. It is an unquenchable fire and a bottomless pit into which they keep falling. It is darkness that never ends, separation that goes on forever from all that is good, from the power and the love and the light of God. Friends, hell would hold no terror, and I would be less inclined to preach it if it meant the complete annihilation of the person, if it meant we would stop existing. But it does not. It is everlasting suffering. It is a place of weeping and gnashing of teeth. It is sorrow upon sorrow and frustration upon frustration with no hope of ever escaping. Those slides went by pretty fast, so weeping and gnashing of teeth with no hope of ever escaping. The unseen reality is that unbelievers will exist eternally in the lake of fire. For many people, Their hell begins now, even as our eternal life in Christ begins now. When we live our lives on earth separated from God by our sin, without the atoning blood of Jesus applied to us by faith, we already experience the beginning of hell on earth. John Wesley told a true story from back in his day to illustrate what that life is like right now for those without Jesus in his sermon that's entitled On Living Without God. He claims that there were a large number of people who were witnesses to this account of the toad. So apparently, this is a true story. 
Now, I'm going to retell it for our day rather than quoting Wesley because his story is rather long. It seems there was an ancient oak tree that was cut down and it was split in two. When they split the tree in two, a living toad crept out from the heart of the tree. The witnesses to this strange event surmised that it might have been living and closed in that tree for 100 years. Wesley muses concerning what sort of life that would be. It apparently had all of the necessary organs for sensing the world, but no occasion for sensing anything. In the dark encasement of that tree trunk, it could only feel what pressed in on it, could see and hear nothing of the true world outside of that tree. It could therefore experience no pleasure or interact with anything else living. The toad had no means of living a productive life. It could only be motionless in the narrow cavern in which it had become encased. As the toad was unable to have any interaction with the visible world, John Wesley concludes that those who live without God have no ability to interact with the invisible world of God's kingdom that is here already and is yet to come in its fullness. They cannot perceive what Christ has done for them. They cannot taste the goodness of God. Their senses are dulled by the material world that presses in upon them, and they cannot hear or see God. They regard him as though he is not, because they live encased in the darkness. They cannot hear the voice of God or feel the wind of his spirit. Nevertheless, friends, there is good news. Here's the hope. The gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ can crack open the trunk of that tree in which they are encased and shine the light of the living God into their lives. As long as they are here on this earth, there is hope. Our God is the God who makes the way in the wilderness. He is the God who provides streams in the desert. He beckons and he woos and he calls us to come home to him as long as this age goes on. That's why we're still here on earth today, beloved family. While life on earth goes on and we await Christ's return, we are growing in his likeness as we continually tell you. As we become like Jesus, we find we have another purpose beyond our own well-being, beyond our own growth. We are part of the good news. We wield the acts of the gospel that can break open the hearts of unbelievers and shatter the darkness in which they live with the penetrating light and love of Christ. While we are here, we scatter the seeds of the gospel. While we are here, we distribute the yeast of the kingdom by proclaiming the goodness of our God to everyone everywhere and inviting them to come into life by faith in Jesus. Those who have yet to turn to Jesus need to hear the gospel. This is an urgent matter. They need to hear the gospel over and over and over again from different sources at different times so the reality of the kingdom can grow in their awareness and they can wake up to life in Christ like that toad woke up to life outside the tree trunk in the vast creation that he had never seen before. Some have never seen Jesus. We must show them who Jesus is. We must sound forth the call of the gospel of their salvation, that they too may be saved from everlasting destruction. 
the good news is that as long as life continues on this earth, every human being has opportunity to choose. They can choose life and joy in Christ or death and suffering apart from him. What makes our proclamation and invitation so urgent is that the option they do not have is to cease existing we will all go on eternally, either in life or in everlasting decay and suffering and death. If you have any love for Jesus, you will also love your fellow human beings around you and have compassion on them. You are becoming like Jesus, who loves all, and has shown his love for us by dying for us that we all might live. We too deserved the unquenchable fires of hell. We were once Christ's enemies. We were weeds in the field of the kingdom, but we have received the blessed gift of our salvation in him. We are now the finest wheat kingdom seeds scattered all around the world. God waits in loving patience for the perfect time for Christ's return. He waits on us to be his representatives of love in this world, scattering kingdom seeds, distributing the gospel yeast, wielding the gospel axe, and bringing to faith all who will come before it is too late before the first death overtakes them and the angels come to separate the wheat and the weeds and to throw the weeds into the second death, the lake of unquenchable fire. Look around you in your circles of influence, your friends, your workplace, your neighborhood, your family. Who appears to not yet know life in Jesus? Will you tell them? Will you put the invitation before them? Will you give them the opportunity to choose life for all eternity? I pray that you will, and soon, before it's too late. Let us pray. Lord Jesus, make us more like you, more interested in the eternal destination of those around us, more compassionate for those who are living in darkness and headed for an eternity of suffering. Show us the opportunities you ha we have to warn them and to invite them into life in you. Give us a burning desire within that no one in our circle of acquaintance shall leave this life without hearing the invitation to eternal life by faith in you, Jesus. In your precious name we pray, amen. Well, Christ our Lord invites to his table all who love him, who earnestly repent of their sin and seek to live in love and peace with one another. As we come to this table today, it is good for us to remember that we come by Christ's invitation and by his mercy we come as sinners in need of his forgiveness, and therefore we must come confessing our sins before him. So will you join me in the prayer of confession that you'll find on the screen? Holy Lord, we have sinned times without number and been guilty of pride and unbelief, of failure to seek your will in your word, of neglect to remember you in the moments of our daily life. Our transgressions present us with a long list of accusations, but in you they will not stand against us, for all have been laid upon Jesus. Let not the passions of our flesh nor the lusting of our minds bring us down into the pit, but rule over our hearts and grant us the liberty, life, and power we find in your name alone. We pray in the most powerful name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. 
Now take just a moment to confess your personal sins before the Lord. God promises that when we confess our sins and repent of our ways, he will create in us a clean heart and he will renew a right spirit in us. He will not cast us away or take his Holy Spirit from us, but he will restore the joy of our salvation and he will sustain us with his bountiful spirit, making our calling sure as we walk in his ways. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. Glory to God. Amen. And now as new and forgiven people, will you take just a few moments to extend to one another the peace of Christ as we prepare the table. The peace of Christ be with you. As you're taking your seats, then we will join together in the great thanksgiving. You'll find your responses on the screen. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and a good and joyful thing, always and everywhere, to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. You made from one every nation and people to live on all the face of the earth. Before the mountains were brought forth or you had formed the earth, from everlasting to everlasting you alone are God. You created light out of darkness and brought forth life on the earth. You formed us in your image and breathed into us the breath of life. When we turned away and our love failed, Your love remained steadfast. You delivered us from captivity, made covenant to be our sovereign God, and spoke to us through your prophets. And so with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Holy are you, and blessed is your Son, Jesus Christ, in whom you have revealed yourself, our light and our salvation. In his baptism and in table fellowship, he took his place with sinners. Your Spirit anointed him to preach good news to the poor, to proclaim release to the captives and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, and to announce that the time had come when you would save your people. By the baptism of his suffering, death, and resurrection, you gave birth to your church, delivered us from slavery to sin and death, and made with us a new covenant by water and the Spirit. On the night in which Jesus gave himself up for us, he took bread. He gave thanks, he broke the bread. 
And he gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And when the supper was over, he took the cup, gave thanks to you, gave it to his disciples and said, Drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. So in remembrance of these your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here and on these gifts of bread and wine. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ, that we may be for the world the body of Christ, redeemed by his blood and empowered by his spirit. By your spirit make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at his heavenly banquet. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit in your holy church, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. Now with the confidence of the children of God, let us pray together the prayer that our Lord Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. We'll invite you to come to the front here and Jean and Brenda will be on one side and we'll be on the other side and uh, you can receive both the, the bread and the cup. You're welcome to stay here and receive or you're welcome to take them back to your seat. If you're not able to come forward, just stay where you are. The ushers will pay attention to that and we'll bring the, uh, we'll bring the, the sacrament to you right where you're seated. But whether here at the front or in your, in your pew, receive the gift of life, new life in Christ Jesus, life that is abundant and eternal.
There's a responsive prayer of thanks that will be up on the screen and we'll pray it together. God of grace, you renewed us at your table with the bread of life. We have tasted and we have seen that you are good. You have again delivered us in these moments from every evil habit and every stain of our former sins. Everything that dims the brightness of your grace in us and keeps us from taking delight in you. We rise to go in the peace and restoration of our Lord Jesus to bless you among all people and look forward to your coming again in glory. We, we give, give you thanks, thanks in Jesus', Jesus most, most precious name. name. Amen. Amen. Just simply know that Christ calls you. He invites you to come and to receive him. And this would be a wonderful time to do it if you've never taken that step as we sing softly and tenderly, Jesus is calling. Let's stand and sing together.
that was a depressing, is it green? Yes, there we go. That was something of a depressing message, I understand that, but I hope that two things. One is that those of you who have your hearts breaking for people in your families or in your friends who do not know Jesus, that you will just, you will just double down on your commitment to live before them the love and the mercy and the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and that you will pray continually for them. I have them in my own family and my heart breaks for them when I preach a message like that. It reminds me how much I need to double down on that witness before them. And the second thing is go rejoicing, friends, if you have said, yes, Jesus, I'm a sinner in need of your saving grace, then you will live eternally. And you don't even know the half of the joys that will be yours when you come into his kingdom. So you can go in joy, but go with the urgency of the gospel, sending you into the lives of those who do not yet know. May it be so. Amen? Amen. Amen.